This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abutamarco here with Dr. Bart Jacobs to discuss his article published in Neurology titled Cerebral Spinal Fluid Findings in Relation to Clinical Characteristics, Subtype and Disease Course in Patients with Guillain-Barre Syndrome. Bart is a professor in immunology and neurology at Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam, Netherlands. Bart has been a frequent guest on the podcast and has provided some really helpful information around the management and treatment for GBS. He joined us on September 15th, 2022, discussing how preceding infections in GBS can affect outcomes, and again on February 10th, 2022, where he highlighted the utility of the modified Erasmus GBS outcome score. Bart, hello and welcome back. Hello, Justin. Bart, it feels like CSF findings in GBS kind of serves as this foundational piece of knowledge in neurology. Albumin cytologic dissociation was even described in the seminal cases dating back to the 1900s. But as you outlined in your paper, right, there are some really important unanswered questions surrounding this well-known phenomena, along with other CSF changes that I certainly wasn't aware of. So I'm excited to dive into these results with you. With that, maybe you could describe what was the major findings from this? Indeed, what intrigued us was this finding that was originally uh, described by Guillain Barre more than 100 years ago. When they described in the CSF this finding of an increased protein level in combination with a normal cell count. And in those days, it was very important to use this feature to distinguish the new syndrome with the poliomyelitis. And you find this still in, in all the medical textbook that all indicate that this is a very typical finding for GBS. Because of this, CSF is frequently used in the diagnostic workup of uh, GBS. But how is it really performing in practice? And that is what we investigated in the current study. So uh, we used for that the first 1,500 patients included in the International GBS Outcome Study, or IGOS. And this is an observational cohort study, including the full spectrum of patients with GBS, including all variants, subtypes, and severities. And from 1,231 patients, we had CSF data available for the current study. And our main finding was that dissociation indeed was frequently present in patients with GBS, but that normal protein levels also occur frequently, up to half of the patients when the CSF is obtained in the very early state of the disease course. So an increased protein level was found in CSF, and it was also associated with a severe clinical course and the demyelinating subtype of GBS. Also, we investigated the cell counts in CSF, and indeed, as Guillain and Barre predicted, that was usually absent, but we also found that a mild increase in cell count, up to 50 per microliter, was found in 70% of the patients. And in 13 patients, there was even a higher cell count than 50. Some of these CSFs were obtained after start of IVIG, so that could be a possible explanation. But for the other cases, there was no other explanation found. So we think that an increased cell count may be compatible with the diagnosis GBS, although we suggest, of course, to always exclude other causes first. I guess there were a few major points there that we were seeing an elevation in CSF protein in the majority of patients, but seemed to be related to the timing of symptom onset and when CSF was taken, and that the vast majority of patients had non-inflammatory CSF, though there were a few that had slight pleocytosis that we can talk about a little later. What causes the albumin cytologic dissociation, and why does it seem to be so time-dependent? Well, I think the mechanism for the increased protein levels in CSF and GBS is still largely unknown. The classic explanation is the increase of the permeability in the blood nerve barrier. So that explains why albumin from the blood comes then to CSF. I think another factor is the involvement of the most proximal part of the nerve roots, which of course are in close contact with the cerebrospinal fluid. And I think that part of the increased protein may reflect the inflammation and the injury of these nerves. Interesting, if you do an MRI of the nerve roots of patients, you can also see there a thickening and sometimes a gadolinium enhancement, which supports the diagnosis as well. And and it just illustrates the involvement of these nerve roots. I think another important finding here is that we found that patients with an increased protein level more frequently had pain and a global distribution of limb weakness, which I think is also compatible with the involvement of nerve roots. 
probably the involvement of those roots also explains why there is a more severe weakness and disability and probably also why these patients have a poor prognosis compared to the other patients. So there does seem to be some kind of biological reasoning on why we would see correlation between the total CSF protein levels and outcomes in your mind? I think it's just a reflection of what is the inflammation that's ongoing on the nerve roots. And probably that is influencing the blood nerve barrier as well. So at a very local situation there, I think you can just see that in the CSF. And I think that not all the neurologists realize that the most proximal part of the peripheral nervous system is involved in most of the cases of GBS. And you touched on this previously, but what is the utility of an MRI L-spine with contrast in these cases? How do you use that in your clinical practice? Well, I think the, the standard investigation for the nerve roots is probably the nerve conduction studies. And in Europe, there is an, a lot of facilities in, in almost all hospitals where there is a large neurological department to do nerve conduction studies. So that's our technique of choice to uh, investigate the nerve roots. But if there are no nerve conduction facilities in an hospital, I think an MRI scan or an ultrasound is an alternative. And indeed, I think that especially MRI scan, you can see a thickening of the nerve roots and this gadolinium enhancement showing that the blood nerve barrier is permeable. And that is supporting, in my view, the, the diagnosis of TBS. But you have to take into account that also other diseases may have this finding. And of course, when you do an MRI scan, you cannot differentiate between a demyelinating and an axonal form of GPS, which is possible when you do a nerve conduction study. How does CSF results help in terms of diagnosing the different GPS variants? Are there clues to help make that final diagnosis? And are there other diagnostic procedures where we talked about MRI and EMG that clinicians should be employing? I think it is remarkable that GBS is such a clinically diverse disease and that there are indeed these variants, such as the pure motor form of GBS when there's no sensory deficits. I've seen patients with a paraplegic form, so only affecting the legs. Another well-known variant is the Miller-Fisher syndrome, where you have this symptom of ophthalmoplegia and ataxia, but no weakness of the limbs. And there are bulbar variants where People have problems with speaking and, and swallowing, but apart from that, no other weaknesses. So that shows that it is very diverse, this disease. And indeed, we found some association with the CSF protein levels and these clinical variants. For instance, in the sensory motor form, these are largely elevated, but in the Miller-Fisher syndrome, there frequently is no increase in, in the protein level. But these associations were not strong enough to have additional diagnostic value for distinguishing between clinical variants. So for the diagnosis in this study, we just based ourselves on the clinical findings in patients. But I think it's an important question. You may also ask if the CSF protein level helps in differentiating GBS from mimics of GBS, so a true other form of disease. For example, some form of myelopathy or deficiencies in the differential diagnosis of GBS are also known to have an increased protein level in CSF. And obviously, in the days of the first descriptions of guillain barre poliomyelitis was a frequent cause which needed to be distinguished. But nowadays, the differential diagnosis is very different. And at present, we are conducting an extensive study in which data and diagnostic tests are collected from patients which have a disease that mimics GBS, but in fact is something else. And hopefully this cohort will answer the question about the specificity of these findings in CSF. And of course, that will be very important for diagnostic criteria as well. Definitely. And it sounds like there's some more to come here. I wanted to jump back. We talked briefly about cell counts in GBS. What did you find in terms of that in the cohort? And how should that inform management or further workup? When I was trained as a neurologist, I was learned that that increase in cell count could never be found by a patient with a true case of, of GBS. But our study shows that it is different, that 17% of the patients had a higher cell count. That means a higher cell count than 5 per microliter. And in 13 patients, there was even an increased cell count of higher than 50 per microliter. And we had, of course, in this uh, observational cohort study, an extensive diagnostic workup and a very long follow-up of patients. And in all these patients, no other diagnosis 
was found. So that suggests that an especially mildly elevated cell count in CSF may still be compatible with the diagnosis of GBS. But I would like to emphasize here that an increased cell count could also be considered a red flag that requires rethinking the diagnosis and it's important to exclude other causes in, uh, in patients where you see an, an increase in cell count. Despite this limitation, I think that the diagnostic value of CSF in case of patients suspected of GBS is still the exclusion of other diseases with uh, pleocytosis. And I think you and your group made this interesting correlation between those patients with slight pleocytosis and treatment with IVIG. What did you find there? Yes, that is indeed an important point. So. It is known that treatment with intravenous immunoglobulins may cause a pleocytosis. And maybe you know this from practice that some patients even develop symptoms of an aseptic meningitis. So this could have explained for some patients at least the increase in cell count in CSF because sometimes the CSF was obtained after start of the treatment. But in the other patients, we found no such an explanation. So in a patient with such a finding, I think I would also think again critically about the diagnosis first and if needed, perform further investigations before attributing the finding to the treatment. And therefore, I would like also to recommend to obtain CSF before the start of treatment. And I know that CBS is a rapidly progressive disease and sometimes the patients need early treatment as soon as possible. But even then, I think in practice, it is probably possible to have the CSF done first before starting IVIG. There are no absolute rules in neurology, right? So, you know, a pleocytosis doesn't exclude the diagnosis, but just being mindful. And it seems like mild pleocytosis, what you saw in the vast majority of your patients, and then how treatment can impact it. These are really helpful girls. How do we extrapolate some of these findings to pediatric cases? I know your study contained a little over 100 cases, but was obviously heavily weighted towards the adult population. So how should we think through that cohort? The group of children included in our study was about hundreds, but still relatively small, I would say. But we found more or less the same results as in adult patients. So some children also had a normal protein level or a mildly elevated cell count. But this group of patients was too small to conduct proper clinical association studies. So we do not know if it is related to the clinical severity. So I think probably the same mechanisms are playing a role there in children with GBS. But I would like to emphasize there, with respect to CSF diagnostic, there are two issues in which children with GBS may differ from adults. The first one is that the reference values for CSF protein level are considerably lower in children than in adults. So previously, our group has defined age-specific reference values for children older than six months old, which starts at 0.25 grams per liter and increases to 0.34 grams per liter at the age of 18 years. So that's lower than what you see in adults. And I think a second difference between children and adults with GBS is their differential diagnosis, which is also age-dependent. So, for example, an important differential diagnosis for children with Guillain-Barré syndrome is this acute flaccid myelitis that's caused by an enterovirus. And that requires a completely different uh, diagnostic workup than what you see in most adult patients. And do we have other useful biomarkers that clinicians can use, whether it be in the blood or CSF? Well, biomarkers have been investigated extensively in GBS, but I would say that their role in the diagnosis is still rather limited. For example, antibodies to uh, ganglocytes that are glycolipids that are residing in the peripheral nerve. From a lot of research, it is known that they play a direct role in the injury of the peripheral nerves in GBS and its variants. But in general, their frequency is too low, and because of that, they lack sensitivity for the diagnosis. I also would like to emphasize that the demonstration of antibodies highly depends on the assay that is used for this in the diagnostic setting. So that may also influence the frequency of the antibodies that are found. In some specific clinical settings, these antibodies may be helpful for the diagnosis. And I would like to mention as an example, the detection of GM1 antibodies in patients with a pure motor GBS and the demonstration of GQ and B antibodies for patients with ophthalmoplegia, like in the Miller-Fisher syndrome or an overlap syndrome to a GBS. But at present, GBS is still largely 
A clinical diagnosis supported by electrophysiology and after exclusion of other causes for which CSF examination is still helpful. And Bart, maybe I could push just a little bit more because I think this is a common clinical scenario. Do you routinely order ganglioside panels for your typical GBS patients? Do you find that informative? Or are you really looking for those red flag features that would push you towards obtaining those tests? So we are the reference laboratory in the Netherlands for testing these antibodies. But still, I would say that we are testing these antibodies only in a minority of the GBS cases. So it still is not required for the official diagnostic criteria. And only in these specific situations where you have a true differential diagnosis and it's difficult to have the final diagnosis, then it can be helpful to test these antibodies provided that the assay has been evaluated in practice and you know exactly how it is performing also in other diseases that look like GBS. And one other question. We talked about the fact that like a significant pleocytosis, right, greater than 50 cells in a CSF is a red flag for this diagnosis. For the inverse, can we see extreme levels of protein elevation in GBS or should that be another red flag when we have highly elevated CSF total protein levels? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Justin, and I'm afraid that we have not addressed this in the paper, but it's good to say something about it in the podcast. So in our study, we saw a range of protein levels up to five grams per liter, but most were below two grams per liter. So our study was not designed to determine the specificity of extreme values, but there are some disorders that need to be excluded when confronted with such high values. So recently, just for an example, I was consulted for a patient from another hospital in the Netherlands who was suspected of the diagnosis of GBS, but because of a rapidly progressive tetraparesis. But this patient had a CSF protein level of nearly 10. Indeed, then it was demonstrated that this patient had a tumor metastasis of the cervical spine. This shows that extreme high protein values could be considered a red flag as well. And at present, we are conducting this, uh, what we call the GBS mimic study. And I hope that will show the specificity of these extreme high findings uh, and what type of diseases may occur in practice where you should uh, do further diagnostic workup. Yeah, we're really excited to hear about those results, right? Because the differential, as you mentioned, can be challenging. Absolutely. Bart, I just want to thank you so much for your time today and providing this holistic review around GBS again. You know, I think in a world where testing has become more complicated, it's reassuring to focus on these simple CSF studies. That could be so informative, right? Having data that's available within hours of collection and without fancy equipment. I don't think we can emphasize how impactful that is for patients, family members, and clinicians. No, absolutely. So we are investigating very advanced biomarkers, which can be tested with very complex machinery only. But of course, it will take uh, decades for, before that is reaching clinical practice. And I think that's very helpful with the CSF examination that it is at hand in all hospitals. So still, I think Guillain and Barre needs to be reserved credits for that, of having this uh, investigation uh, for uh, our current practice. Without a doubt. Well, for our listeners, please check out the article in Neurology, again, titled Cerebral Spinal Fluid Findings in Relation to Clinical Characteristics, Subtype, and Disease Course in Patients with GBS. Bart, thanks again. Thank you. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening and for letting us join you on your commute, while you're exercising, or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients.